as we've described before, certain times, certain industries are favorable to startups, whereas other industries are favorable to the people that are already in there competing because they have complementary assets and the like. They have distribution, they have customers, they have advertising, they have learning, that sort of thing. So this, uh, in this particular lecture, we'll introduce this concept and then in further ones down the line, we'll talk about what favors an incumbent versus a startup and the like. But let's get started and think about why some industries are favorable to new firms. That is, they're favorable that allow a startup to jump in there on an equal playing field, as we've said, because some new technology or other trend is sort of lev has leveled the playing field or trends are such that the market is growing so rapidly that lots of players can be in there and succeeding at the same time. And some types of opportunities, though, are favoring the people that are already there. They have this innate advantage of already being in the marketplace and having these complementary assets. That's what we'll be thinking about. So what are these dimensions under which to think about this problem? Well, there are capital intensive firms, require large plant, large equipment, um, lots of money, a real estate type of a plant, uh, lots of, uh, of assets uh, uh, of a factory or automobiles, equipment, trucks. And then there are knowledge intensive industry that require industrious, intelligent, educated, um, experienced people that can work together to make the product or service. <clears throat> Capital intensive industries tend to favor people that have the capital, that is the incumbents. Whereas knowledge industries tend to favor the people that are startups because essentially if you need five smart people to develop a software package or an application, whether you're doing that or Microsoft is doing that, you still need five people to develop the application. And the application has its own value going forward. So here's some examples of industries that favor on the left-hand side, they favor capital intensive industries, they favor incumbents, and on the other side, the knowledge intensive industries that might favor individuals. Telecommunications requires switches, equipment, um, under, underground uh, cables, that sort of thing. That's a lot of assets. That's a lot of money to put in, like cable companies have to put in cable to everybody's house. There's actually physical wires or optical fibers connecting homes with buildings and the like. That favors people that are already there. It's pretty hard to go and dig up the roads again if you want to start your own telecommunications or cable company. Whereas a software company, you could write the software and upload it on the internet tomorrow. So that's something we can do as a startup. Similarly with energy, energy generation, the big utilities, or the oil companies like ExxonMobil and the like. Those all favor existing players that have a lot of buildings, a lot of assets, refineries and that sort of thing. Energy generation plants, nuclear power plants, coal power plants, whatever, natural gas plants. But there are in that industry people that actually identify where the next oil field might be, or they come up with new ways to make the energy development more efficient, or a different uh, aspects of cars that make a smart car smarter, for example. Those kind of add-on companies that create these new products that, are, that need knowledge, like geologists in, in oil production or whatever, or software engineers to make a car smart, a smart car smarter, those still oftentimes can be companies that are supported by design firms, engineering firms, knowledge firms. And again, those favor small startups for the reasons we've described. Semiconductor fabrication, these are huge plants. In fact, it costs a billion dollars to start a new plant to make semiconductors, that is the chips in your phones and the like. But at the same time, designing the next good chip is engineering, it's knowledge intensive. You don't have to make it to have the design, which then you patent and all of that and you license the design to other companies. So even though you have huge industries with lots of plant and equipment, trucking industries and firms like that, hospitals, there are small firms that are on the outside of that that add the knowledge capital. And those are where the startups can play. So when you have an idea, if it relates to something that's in a big industry like automotive, you don't necessarily build a car. You want to find a niche that is favorable to startups 
which is this idea of knowledge intensive rather than capital intensive, and then figure out how to fit your business into this overarching ecosystem. That's the play to make. Similarly and related, you have this idea of economies of scale versus linear costs. When it's asset intensive, a large operation, large buildings, large equipment, you get huge economies of scale. When Intel makes another microprocessor, it costs almost nothing to make another 100,000 or million microprocessor chips. You starting from scratch would cost you millions of dollars just to make one. Why? Because you have to put all that plant in place. They have economies of scale. You do not. Certain types of things are more linear in cost. For example, making films or making records or writing books. Again, things that are knowledge intensive, that require educated, trained, experienced human beings to do the work. That sort of thing is linear. Because if you have five people writing a program and you want it to go faster, you can't necessarily just add more people. Having a thousand of them doesn't necessarily help because it's the, the basic knowledge of those few people that is really what's adding the value. Those favor you as well. Things like software and games and that sort of thing. Likewise, traditional retail requires lots of buildings, distribution channels, logistics operations, and whatever. Whereas Amazon, when it started, and other small companies can challenge that now because they can make use of the logistics support of the Amazon back office or the UPS back office and start an internet company with very little in terms of assets. When lots of assets are required, which means distribution channels, retail operations, logistics, equipment, trucks, that sort of thing, big guys are favored when it's what people do and what they think and what they create personally or individually or in groups that favors us as startups. The last piece of the puzzle is concentrated industries versus fragmented industries. Concentrated industries means when you think of the company like you might think of airlines, right? How many airlines are there? Well, it used to be more, but now there's only a few. U.S. Air, um, Southwest Air, these are a small number of companies that are left. There's been so many mergers. Automobiles the same way. There's either GM or Ford. There's Chrysler, Fiat. You also have Toyota. I mean, there's a few big companies. Many industries are that way. Now, you think about the Internet now, you have Microsoft and Apple that make um, computer products. Uh, Dell and Hewlett Packard make PCs. So there's, those are the concentrated industries. Fragmented industries are ones that you can't really think of the big players. Uh, you might think about uh, hair salons, or you might think about um, waste treatment, or waste you know, disposal companies. You might think about landscaping operations, or you might think about um, local restaurants, various types, before there were these large chains that people tend to go to. Fragmented industries don't really have this concentration. Those favor us as well. Going ag against Applebee's on the restaurant side is a tough prospect. But going against local Thai restaurants with a new Thai restaurant with a different menu and maybe uh, better advertising and marketing and a different and a nice uh, uh, ambiance might be something that you could be successful at, right? And then and then grow it. So. When you look at this picture, you see that the trick of making a fortune in entrepreneurial and in business generally is to start over here with a knowledge intensive, linear cost, fragmented business and turn it into a concentrated, economies of scale driven, capital intensive business. This is what Amazon ultimately did. They started out online business. Knowledge intensive, they had software development basically, they sold only books. Book selling was a pretty fragmented industry at the time. And then they started concentrating it to be Amazon. They built up these huge logistics operations all over the world and a very capital intensive kind of organization. So that, so that now it's really difficult for anyone to compete. And by and large, people use, small online companies use Amazon's logistics infrastructure for distributing their products and services as well. 
you can't go after the big guys directly. There's room to come in on the knowledge linear cost side to help enhance the product and services that they offer. And one of the ways that you do the harvest is to create that and then ultimately merge into one of these companies. You could develop a new product like Instagram and merge that into Facebook. You can develop a new product like Skype and merge that into Microsoft. Or you can start and build a whole new company and try to create something new by following that process I described, which you can see what happened with Home Depot, it happened with Domino's Pizza, examples all over the place. We'll talk more in a few, in the next couple lectures about what favors us as startups and what to watch out for with incumbents and then summarize that in the final lecture. We'll see you then.